Hello, and welcome to my spoiler discussion of Umineko. This will be full spoilers. Do not watch this if you don't know the full story of Umineko. Even if you're normally fine with spoilers, I am straight up talking about stuff at the very end of the game, very quickly, like immediately in fact, and I'm not going to entirely explain stuff. I'm not going to fully give context all of the time, so you probably just won't even know what I'm talking about at points. So please, do play the game, watch my videos. It will probably take years for me to get through all of it, so understandable if you don't want to wait. But know that this is going to give away huge elements from later in the game. Okay. You've had plenty of time to leave now. Uh, so, this is going to cover the my first episode, which goes right up until Rosa appears. And I'm basically going to be watching over the footage I recorded, thinking about lines, thinking about what stood out to me, and kind of making remarks on things that had occurred to me as I was playing. Because it turns out when you've got a text as dense as Umineko is, when you play it through a second time, you notice things that maybe you didn't notice the first time, at least not quite as much. One thing I, that was always funny is I never paid much attention to the descriptions that were that are written of the episodes, like telling you welcome to Rokinjima and then giving you not really a summary of what the episode is going to be, but kind of a primer for it. This and also a lot of the character description stuff I just didn't really look at very much, but I'm going to be paying way more attention this time. And one thing these have is they refer to a difficulty level. And uh, I don't know if that correlates to the notion of trying to solve the mystery for that particular episode, but I'm definitely going to be kind of digging into that a little more and seeing if that lines up. For instance, knowing uh, knowing more about Beatrice, will that allow me to go, oh, this person could have easily done these murders, and like also just having the right framework of looking at the murders and knowing, knowing conceptually what red text is. Obviously, it's not going to exist in the first episode, but looking at the first episode and going, no one ever actually confirms the death of this character, so I should not assume this character is dead just because they appeared to be, and other characters assumed them to be. Stuff like that is probably going to be key to the mystery, and I suspect that, given those tools, I expect this mar first mystery is probably not that complex. But who knows? We'll find out when we get there. I'm looking forward to that because the first time through, I just took it as a roller coaster and was like, I will not forget to say it. And honestly, basically, yeah, couldn't figure it out. About five minutes before Beatrice's backstory, I did half guess what it was, but honestly, I just needed to be told it to fully understand. Uh, it's funny to me that the opening kind of standard disclaimer about stories being fic the story being fictional and fantastic and there's no resembling to existing individuals organizations locations or incidents is very funny to me it reads as like a joke it is also obviously all fictional but even within the fictional universe the majority of what you're playing is also fictional or is it basically is, because you don't know for sure whatever happened on Rock and Jima. You get a lot of... You can know that Ava survived. You know that Battler managed to survive at the very, very end. Again, I sure hope you're still not listening if you care about spoilers. But it's a cat box. You can't know the specifics of the events of the incident. Because they never open Ava's journal. And so the possibility space has not collapsed, and any one of these eight episodes could be true, for all you know. But we don't know. So at, effectively, these are all in-universe fictional stories. They resemble real individuals and events, 
but even in terms of is this really what Kinzo was like? Because in the story... <laughs> now here's the layers. In the fiction, even, it's not actually Kinzo. Kinzo doesn't appear. Any... Well, we'll get to timeline things with this in a bit, I guess. But almost all appearances of Kinzo in this game, even if we were taking these things as depictions of what happened. I don't know how to phrase this properly. Even within the fictional universe of episode one, Kinzo's not there. <laughs> Kinzo is dead already, and they are just faking as if he has survived. So, even a further layer, he resembles an existing individual, but he himself is not actually present. He is not depicted. And also, the key word there is resembles. He is based on people's understanding of him. Obviously, the real person being dead, he is not behaving as himself. Therefore, the people who are covering up his death are using signifiers of him. They are acting in a way that is recognizably him, but that's distinct from what he himself would be doing. Anyway, that's a lot to spin ahead of this. I'm sure even if it's intentionally a joke, was not intended to be strictly speaking so deep, but it really does immediately connect to themes in a very funny way to me. This opening conversation immediately makes me just... I... I just hate Kinzo. I do understand that the ending of this game is meant to... It is not meant to soften an, an abuser, but it is meant to have you... You're meant to extend empathy to people and understand their different situations, their possibility space. What truths are theirs? And even if you don't agree with them, understand that those truths exist. But also, just fuck Kinzo. He does utterly reprehensible things, and the very opening of the game. I was starting when I was playing this going, I know the opening's pretty slow, it's mostly introducing the characters, I don't know if I'll have much to say in a spoiler episode, but I really have to say fuck Kinzo, because he is so shitty in this opening when he is utterly unwilling to make a will, because he is focused on himself and his wishes. While Nanjo is here trying to go, hey, you know that grandchild that you uh, currently think is dead? But you know, you could maybe still clear things up with that. Maybe you could record some sort of wishes. Maybe you can not let that person just disappear without any knowledge, without people ever really finding out, knowing what's going on. Maybe you want to tell your family some stuff. But Kinzo's so focused on his own shit that he's just not interested, and also not hearing it. And I do understand there is some dramatic irony here, in that Kinzo doesn't know. He thinks that grandchild died. And Genji and Nanjo specifically are the two who know that that's not true, and that in fact they kept the child alive, allowed the child to grow up. I'm going to see how this unfolds timeline-wise. I'm going to keep some light notes. If it's ever relevant, I will show on screen some of my timeline ideas. This is obviously not during the first episode. I suspect this is actually when Kinzo is alive, or at least that's the way we should be reading it. In terms of reality, everything should be taken with a grain of salt. I'm assuming this is before Nanjo and the servants decided to introduce Kinzo to his grandchild, and so we'll see how that plays out. Also a good early illustration is literally using a chess game, <laughs> which means that they get to do their first of many uses of the screenshot of a chess game. Using the chess game as a metaphor to describe something that is more abstract, and a thing that seems particularly relevant is the fact that the, uh, the thing the chess game is describing it is abstract because it's hard to quantify. Nanjo doesn't know an actual exact timeline for Kinzo's death. He can't tell him straight up, you're going to die by this date, because he could easily be wrong. 
Spoiler alert though, he's not. Turns out he's extremely correct. But that using a chess game, he can make an analogy that is communicable without needing medical knowledge, without needing to get into nitty-gritty details of the illness. He's just communicating a notion for something that Kinzo is already aware of. So Kinzo can relate to this in the same way that the game that Beatrice and Battler are going to end up playing is also very complex, dense, and just made up. It's not an existing game you could correlate to, but the metaphor of pieces helps properly understand what's going on and how they're operating on the events of Rakanjima, or the fictional events, or who could say. Also foreshadowing that Kinzo is going to fall into his eternal sleep before their game can be concluded. Beatrice and Battler unfortunately don't quite get to finish their game either. Player Beatrice does not get to come back. Not in that way. Fuck me, this is a very stupid observation, but I do have to say it. In, ca in episode 7, there is a character named Will Wright, who is instrumental in untangling the story of Lion and protecting them. I don't think that's unintentional. That's very funny. I just made Sims jokes when I saw him the first time, but now I know he is the Will that Kinza would never write and should have. He is the will that could have cleared things up, could have made people understand, could have untangled the threads of this complicated family mess. But Ginzo didn't do it. I also think the fact that the will is being recorded for later generations is like a key part of this, where Nanjo is very clearly trying to say, you have a grandchild that has never been addressed, your family doesn't know, and not only that your family doesn't know, but also, Natsuhi was given a baby, deeply resented it and led that baby to die. Natsuhi has no idea what that was. She has never gotten closure or understanding on that. She does technically later in the game. We'll get there eventually. But that's another way in which writing this will could at least help inform Natsuhi on what happened there. Whether or not that truth ends up helping helping is a different question, but the fact that Kinzo's not saying it means that she'll never get that. Given the w things this game has to say about truth, I don't know if strictly speaking informing people more of things is just a default good as far as this game is concerned, but I do think never addressing the existence of Kinzo's child grandchild I'm gonna need to refer to them in some way. I am unclear on which identity is best to use. For now, when I refer to Kinzo's grandchild, you know who I mean. And if you don't, go finish Umineko first. <laughs> I'm gonna keep saying it. I also think Nanjo saying that a will is a place where you could write of your regrets is almost Nanjo hoping to get some confirmation that Kinzo feels like what he did was wrong. <laughs> Kinzo seems like he doesn't tell people shit, but also is like very guarded, even with his close friend, and kind of has to act with a degree of bluster. Like he has to be the proud head of the family. So he's not left the space to be a vulnerable person, to be like, maybe the thing I did's fucked up. I don't think that excuses what he did in the slightest, but I think it's a relevant understanding of why why he's behaving like this and then why Nanjo is kind of trying to poke at it hoping that like hey you know a will is a place where you're allowed to say these things but Kinzo is not having it just like a game a will is a way to communicate not a single thing he wants to leave behind oh god and he even has the great i was born with nothing and i'll die with nothing even though that's categorically untrue, he was made head of a family because he was born into that family. When thinking about Kinzo resisting the idea of wanting to leave a legacy behind, you do have to think about the trauma he has faced as part of his family, and how that affects this. He never wanted to take the headship in the first place. It was a bit of a poison pill, it was a family in decline, it was also just a lot of work. He took it over and was 
deeply depressed, uninterested in it. And later, he managed to resurrect the family. He definitely seems to take some pride in the fact that he turns the fortunes of the family around. But it's not a thing he would have chosen to do. It was a fate that was thrust upon him. And he couldn't be with the actual woman he loved. For many reasons that we'll address later. So I could simultaneously see Kinzo either wanting to not subject his children to the same thing he did of having a particular role thrust upon them that's honestly not worth it, at least as far as he's concerned. Or also, again, Kinzo is proud of what he has done, is resentful of the fact that he is handing it over to children that he expects will destroy it. And it could honestly be both. But even in the read where he is trying to protect his children, his actions are only causing the continuation of the trauma because if he was maybe more direct with them about the situation, about what the headship would entail, about that it's not an ideal situation, but that he was willing to hand it over to such and such a person, or if he just concretely did something about it, there wouldn't be as much squabbling because a lot of the squabbling comes from the fact that there's no concrete air. A lot of the siblings are squabbling because they're hoping to eke out a win in an unresolved situation. And until that possibility space collapses, they're going to keep vying for things. And that's going to cause a lot of the conflict and strife between the different siblings and the stresses upon them. Because these people are all wealthy. They don't need to be successful to live. They need to be successful because it's the game they're playing. If they want to win, they need to be the child who's making the smart business ploys. Uh, when literally none of them are that. But yeah, we'll see that later. But I do also think it's funny that he is like, well, the gold I will leave when I come back. It's like, not all of it. You used some of that gold. <laughs> you have taken. So here's the first time he refers to making a contract with the witch. At this point, when he refers to a witch's contract, I think he means original Beatrice. Italian Beatrice. I suspect this contract is basically an agreement between two people about using that gold, but never fully revealing it because they couldn't. They couldn't straight up tell people how much gold was there. They couldn't take it off the island. If they wanted to use it, they basically just had to use it in tiny amounts, but ultimately not hand it down through the family, because they couldn't bequeath it legally. <laughs> you can't tell people about this mountain of gold, because it's secret Nazi gold. <laughs> and being secret Nazi gold, obviously the only way to inherit it is to solve your father's riddle. Very funny to see one of Kinza's earliest lines being, exclaiming, it's useless, useless, useless. At the moment of my death, my soul will be devoured by the demons of the contract and wiped out of existence. I don't know what the hell he's talking about here. Let me tell you, I've played the whole game and I don't know what Kenzo's on here. I'm not sure if I meant to read anything deeper than him putting occult flavor onto things because he likes the occult. I'll take note of it in case I get any brainwaves, but at the moment it doesn't actually mean a lot to me. <laughs> Aside from him almost resisting legacy because he is only concerned with his own lifespan and then anything that happens after, not his problem. He wants to see Beatrice's smiling face one last time. Buddy, we all do. And this is part of the fuck Kinzo brigade. The one thing he wants to do before he dies is a very selfish, I want to see the smile of the woman I loved. And not just, I want to see this, I want to see this, and for some reason she's withholding it from me. She has, fully has the power to just be right here. But she's just not doing it. And that's just rude. Holding his own life ransom, effectively. <laughs> or his own death. And thus begins the first of many screams for Beatrice. Okay, I do want to point out that it ends with a message in a bottle. <laughs> What is or, well, a bottle on the beach, which is presumably one of the messages Beatrice sent out. That's good. 
it's funny how like relentlessly this game will hammer on the it's been eight years point but it's also a good way to imply a kind of transformation in a character a character that's changed because it will come up later the battler could be basically a fake uh, it was one of my theories when i was reading it originally that this might not be the same battler and i mean it's true it's been eight years so this is not the same person that they knew before my theory was something about uh, basically a person coming to blackmail members of the family who was not who they thought but was posing as battler because it was convenient to get in easily blah 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 that is a potential explanation for a later episode that we'll get to but it's not categorically meant to be the general truth of this character but he is a different person the fact that it's been eight years does matter the fact that it's been six years means he's not the same person because people change and grow and that would be true even if you'd known that person for that whole six years but not seeing them for six years makes the change more apparent what's funny is some of them would literally only have seen each other once a year for those six years but that would still be enough to not feel like a sudden change that would be enough to feel like it's just a gradual like oh i guess yeah he's gotten a bit taller again this year but specifically having an extended period of time of not seeing someone creates the situation where it feels like such a concrete change and shift also they waste no time with rudolph and ava introducing the both the twin concepts of things being in your blood and then the gender roles that are natural for people to assume. Rudolph wasn't tall until his high school years and then he shot up. Battler then naturally has the same blood, so that's probably why this thing is happening. And the thing with the blood that is funny is that is magic. That's people finding two disparate pieces of information and deciding that that naturally leads to the conclusion that they see. But scientifically, that's not how genetics work. That's not a reasoned out logical sense of how that functions. That is people invoking magic to explain and understand the world around them. Meanwhile, Hideyoshi is basically saying, men do this thing. And it's just natural. It's just who you are. Men are competitive. And then suggesting the ways in which that's a good thing. It's like, oh, you work hard. You gotta compete. You gotta build things up for nothing and so forth and like this whole this opening has battler posturing a lot as a man and and doing gross anime tropes to reinforce that to kind of assert a false confidence that he does not have but is absolutely expected to project battler the most insecure man <laughs> speaking of the posturing it's funny how quickly it collapses when ava kind of just gestures at it saying like oh i imagine with your looks with a man with your looks would have girls crying left and right and that looks like uh oh, no n not not me n no n no i'd like to be introduced to girls and like switches to try and do a different kind of posturing because he, uh, as far as he thinks doesn't have those stories so instead he's trying to gesture at oh but i'd love to be introduced to girls and I'll do my male posturing that way instead. Uh, little does he know, he is entirely fucked up. And there is someone who's distraught uh, that he casually made a promise and then didn't contact her for six years. We'll get there. <laughs> In Hideyoshi's description, yet again we get a callback to, this time not blood, but the spiteful genes passed down through Ushuramiya family members. I do want to address this because there is something passed down through the family and there is a spite that is happening there that all of the parents have it kinzo obviously has it and has passed it down to them and the kids don't currently though you can see the seeds of it easily with the way all of the children are treated by their parents because all of them are in some way being fucked up by their parents or fucked around the direction up for debate but it's happening and so it does matter that Hideyoshi was not raised in the Ashuramiya household the fact that he was raised 
just in a different family, different context, and then came in, does mean he does not have the spiteful genes. But it's not actually a genetic Passover. Or, I mean, maybe it is. Who could say? That's the magical explanation, but who knows what's the actual truth? I'm not a geneticist. At the end of the day, this magical explanation's as good as any. This moment with Kyrie where Badly is like, well, as you can tell from our conversation, she's not my real mother. She's basically my stepmother. One, how you define real mother changes a lot of what this means. Badly is presumably saying it in the context of birth mother. Basically, one would assume Battler means birth mother. Like, who is the mo who is my mother who gave birth to me? Because that is my traditionally considered the real mother. But that would be wrong in this case. Not that he knows that, because Kyrie is his mother because the babies got swapped at birth. We'll get into all that later and what that means. I don't think this is a case of Battler being misinformed. Battler grew up with Asumu as his mother. Asumu fulfilled the mother role while he was a child and while he was growing up. A big part of his falling out with Christ is her dying and then Christ just fucking off immediately. So Asumu was Battler's mother, and therefore it was his real mother as far as he's concerned. The other half of this that's funny is saying she's basically his stepmother. It's sort of putting her in limbo because he's not quite accepted her fully as a stepmother. But what else would she be? Just a friend? Dad's girlfriend? Even though they are married. Dad's wife? He's kept Kyrie at arm's length from being family because he doesn't want to have to deal with the loss of his real mother. And again, that's part of this posturing. I think he's playing up them having a very casual, non-familial relationship for that reason because he's more comfortable with this kind of front than with addressing the fact that it's like, yo, you kind of replaced my mom, and I don't like it. As far as Battle is concerned, it's not Kyrie's fault. Is it actually Kyrie's fault? We'll talk about that later. We'll get to that. Ava casually saying, hey Rudolph, isn't that child abuse? Ha ha ha. Is going to underline the amount of abuse done throughout this family. And it is so casual as to be a joke. <laughs> and I don't think tugging on Badly's ear is the most severe one. But I mean, he is just physically hurting his son just to get back at him in a like minor argument that's meaningless. And also Ava's response is to do the same to him, so... You can see pretty clearly how they're just barreling through and going, you know what, gonna just do the same thing, even as I criticize it. Eva and Rudolf arguing about the other one proposing to move the family conference is very funny because it's... This is exactly why the children don't... This is a way in which the cycles of problems are not changing because... If the two of them together said, move the conference, maybe they still wouldn't be listened to, but they'd be from a much stronger position than just a single person saying they would like to. But both of them is shoving the responsibility onto the other. Neither wants to do it alone, but it never occurs to them to say, okay, but what if both of us said this? Probably Rosa would agree too. And they have made that choice for discussing the actual inheritance, but they have not made the leap to, we could also just move to conference. Maybe we could just, in general, do a lot more by being a united front. And I'm assuming that a lot of that comes from the kind of competitiveness that's been ingrained into them, because at the end of the day, Ava doesn't want to overthrow Christ so that they can all share the inheritance fully equally. Ava wants all of it. She knows she has to make compromises and concessions, but then she only wants to make as many as are necessary. The time of year for the family conference is an annoyance, but not a significant enough one that she's going to really trouble herself. And so that means not actually uniting with her siblings. 
I did want to briefly talk about Maria to contrast her to the kind of posturing Battler does. Maria is also being asked to play a particular role, but she is not fulfilling it. She is not projecting the image that Rosa expects of her, and constantly gets scolded for it. It is certainly worth bearing in mind Maria's kind of neurodivergent presentation when thinking about that. Not to mention Rosa's incredibly blunt and forceful parenting style. Even in this early sequence, you have a scene where Rosa herself phrases something very confusing to Maria. She is unwilling to like meet Maria where she is. Maria is clearly confused by Battler seeming like a stranger. And Rosa's response is to say, oh, it's this person, in a way that's quite confusing, at least to Maria. And it then has to fall to George to clarify what's just been said in a way that Maria can follow and lay it out for her. Rosa's often not very good at that. Rosa is often frustrated that her natural instincts are not working. Rosa's approach tends to be the correct thing should just be working, why isn't it? And so she will not make concessions or meet Maria halfway. We'll have plenty more examples of Rosa's parenting style. We'll get deep into those as they go. It's just funny how literally immediately she shows the problem with how she engages with Maria and George shows a potentially better way that requires more patience but seems to help Maria more. One thing I found interesting about Maria not being sure about Battler is that the point at which she accepts, okay, this is Battler, is after he says so. He says, it's me, I am Battler, and she goes, okay, Battler, huh. And that feels like a parallel to her acceptance of Beatrice. She is just willing to accept that this is a person who is Beatrice and doesn't even have the conception later. When people keep asking her who is Beatrice, there is no Beatrice, there has to be somebody else. Maria is not even really doing it out of stubbornness or technically out of conscientiousness. Just she only knows that person as Beatrice. Other family members might say, oh, the actual identity of this person is such and such. But that is not how it works to Maria. Maria has been introduced to Beatrice, and that is Beatrice the Golden Witch. That is not a different person. Even when the fa their family members will suggest things like, oh, did somebody dress up as this person called Beatrice and hand you a letter? So what's the actual identity, Maria? She just sticks to. That's Beatrice. So that does indeed bring me to the end of my first episode. I had more to talk about than I thought. I don't think I will necessarily always do an episode for every video of the playthrough. It's really going to depend on how much I have to say. There are probably cases where I'll have about 10 minutes or less even on a video that I'll probably hold off and just package it with a future video. We'll play it by ear. Looking forward to the next one. Till next time, thank you for watching.